People, how's it going? So today we're going to get started working on yet another dead MacBook. Let's see what's wrong with this. So according to the customer, the issue with this MacBook is that they had no backlight. And then it appears they made the mistake of opening the MacBook. After opening the MacBook, now it has no image and no backlight. Joy. Let's see if we can find some hints. All right. So first things first, there is going to be, by the screen, an inductor between the 3.3 volt power line and the screen. I'll show you that on the schematic over here, on 820-00165. How's everybody doing in the chat here today? Hope you're all having a lovely day, free of COVID. We're stuck here in stage four in New York City. What, what is, is there a stage five? Who knows? Maybe. So, this is an inductor that looks like it's destroyed. This is an inductor. This is the screen. Screen has backlight. Screen has power. Needs power to make image. Needs backlight line to have a backlight. This is the inductor that sits between the three volt output of U8300 and the screen, and it's destroyed. Hmm. The first thing I'd want to do is there a short circuit present, because if there is a short circuit present, then it's just going to blow when I replace it. And I don't want it to blow when I replace it. So I'm going to turn my multimeter on. I'm going to turn on Paul Daniels' amazing multimeter software that always works properly. And we'll see. No short. So it's safe to replace that. Now, next up is the backlight issue. So you have corrosion. See this? That's liquid damage right over there. Yes, you see it much better when I get the camera to focus, don't you? Now this, here's the way it works. So this is, backlight power is going to go through this fuse. After this fuse, the transistor is going to open or close based on what it's told to do. Now there's a signal that's going to go to this transistor, which is then going to allow a voltage divider to work, which is going to open this transistor. This is the voltage divider, by the way, see those two? Then once this transistor opens, the power will go through to the backlight circuit, to the inductor, you have a diode, caps on output, and out. And I'm going to guess that the corrosion is going to have gone to the backlight IC on the other side of the board. I'm also going to guess that this over here, which is all scratched up, that's so sad. Why you scratch? So sad. Anyway, we're going to get the other side of the board. Check it out and see what's going on there. So let's take this board out of the case. By the way, if anybody is interested in a job and is good at hard drive data recovery and has some experience using software like PC3000, clean room environments, please do email me at lewis at rossmangroup.com. If you don't have experience and you email me, I will, I will personally make effort. I will personally put an effort John, Steve is still here. I want to get Steve some an assistance so that he can actually make time to do some videos. But Steve is here. Steve is a valuable, valuable asset. No, Steve has not gotten tired of getting shot in the dick with the Nerf gun. All right, so for no backlight, that often means that we have corrosion on the DCN which on this machine is totally clean, or on the LED driver. Which is totally clean. So I think it might just have to do with the shorted capacitor. And I'm gonna show you how that shorted capacitor is gonna be doing, making this not work on the schematic and the board view. You ready? All right, so let's go over how this works because the first time I looked at this page, this honestly confused me beyond belief. 
and I was I had no idea what I was doing. Okay, ready guys? Big brain mode. Big brain. Okay, so this here is the backlight fuse. This here is battery power. PPSG3 hot. 8.5 volts going to go through here. Now, what is this mess over here? What is all this shit? Okay, let's let's make it simple. So this is this is the backlight circuit over here. This is the power that's going to go to your screen. This whole thing is a backlight circuit. The transistor is a switch. It's going to decide whether or not power goes through to the backlight circuit. Now this is your standard P-channel MOSFET. It says the type up here. The way a P-channel MOSFET works is the power will flow from the source to the drain when the voltage in the gate is lower than the voltage in the source, not higher. So if you were to look up this transistor by googling this model number, you would find that pin 4 is the source, pin 1256 is the drain, and pin 3 is the gate. Now, you need to have lower voltage on the gate than the source, right? Well, here's what we do. <clears throat> so you have this resistor, R7788, that goes between the source and the gate, meaning that the voltage in the source and the gate is always going to be the same, which means it's never going to open. Remember, this is kind of like a light switch. So the way you get a light switch to turn on or off is you flick it on or off. You, you, know, you physically move it. Here, the way you get the switch to turn is so that it passes current is you send a certain amount of power to the gate. So you're going to have 8 volts over here, R7788 is going to take that 8 volts from the source and place it on the gate, meaning it's never going to open. But then you have, what you could do is you could place another resistor between the gate and ground. That's going to then lower the voltage on the gate without lowering the voltage in the source and allow it to open. But before this resistor can get to ground so that it can be a voltage divider and lower the voltage in the gate, then you're going to have to have this transistor open. So what this is going to do, this is an N-channel MOSFET. This is the opposite of a P-channel. An N-channel MOSFET is only going to allow power to go through when the power on this gate is less than the source. An N-channel is going to allow power to go through when the power on the gate is equal to or higher than the source. When I say power, I mean voltage. So here, the source is ground. Zero volts, so anything's going to be higher than zero. So if I send backlight platform reset, that means that this is now connected. The switch is on. Over here, EDP backlight enable. Again, this is going to wind up just connecting the source to the drain, which attaches ground to here. That's also going to be zero. So if EDP backlight enable is three volts, then that's going to be more than zero, because remember, the source is going to be ground. The ground is zero, which means that this now turns on. And now the bottom of this resistor will go to ground, because the bottom of that resistor is going to go here, and then here, and then to ground. So this is just a bunch of switches. So these two signals over here are going to turn each of these transistors on so that power is going to flow from the source to drain. Hold up. And that means that this will be now a voltage divider. Now, if this is now a voltage divider, what that means is that you're going to ha go from having 8 volts up here to about 3 or 4 volts over here. Remember, what a voltage divider is going to do is you have the high voltage at the top, then in the middle, you're going to have the divided voltage, a lower voltage, because some of this stuff is going to get sent to ground. So this resistor says, okay, some of the 8 volts gets to go here, and then this resistor says some of that 8 volts gets to go to ground, which is kind of like your recycle bin or your trash can for, for power. So what you're going to be left with in the middle is like 4 volts. Not 0, not 8, but like 4. So when these two signals are present, that's going to allow this to be a voltage divider, and that's going to allow this transistor to open, because you'll have 3 or 4 volts here instead of 8, and it, it will open because the gate will now be lower than the source. Now, what happens if C7782 shorts because it gets liquid on it? Well, that means that this, and it turns into a wire. If, the capacitor, if that turns into a wire, then the gate and the source over here, there's going to be no resistance. So there's not going to be any ability to have a voltage divider. Because the whole point of a voltage divider, the way this is going to work, is if I have a 301 kilo ohm resistor up here, and then a 147 kilo ohm resistor down here, it's going to send some of my voltage from over here to ground. However, if I have a wire over here, because this cap is dead and turns into a wire, then I don't have a 301 kilo ohm resistor anymore. You understand? Because this cap is running in parallel with this resistor. So it's not going to be 301 kilo ohms of resistance between here and here. It's going to be zero, because this is now a wire. That's not a voltage divider circuit. You can't have a wire at the top of your voltage divider. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. 
because this is going to have the ability to send so much current through to here that even if you're sending a little bit of it to ground with this pathetic little 147 kilo ohm resistor, it's not going to send enough to ground to actually lower the voltage because you have a wire from here to here. So I'm going to knock this cap off and get a backlight. And then I'm going to replace that filter that got broken off and I'm going to get an image. But not in that order. It's actually the image is, you, you have to do image first and then you get backlight after. So let's go. All right. That was honestly a really awful explanation. I've explained transistors in this very circuit in the past before, and I explained it in the document that I made that should be in the link in the video description, and I think I did a great job of it. I think that I am becoming a worse teacher as the years go on, and at some point, perhaps someone who is more enthusiastic about this will come along and replace me. I think my older videos did a really good job of making this really easy to understand, even if you were clueless because I think I had a little bit more natural enthusiasm, and I think that enthusiasm was present because I had been doing videos for one year, not six or seven or eight years. Once you have the same explanation every single day for six or seven or eight years, it's easy to lose the enthusiasm for it. Maybe that and when you realize that YouTube is showing your videos to 1.6% of your actual audience. But I'm not salty. I saw that in Eli's comment section uh, in one of his videos earlier. And someone said, man, I'd love to, you know, I loved when you did tech videos. I want to watch again if you did tech videos. And he's like, no, don't lie to me. No, nah, nah, don't lie to me. I have analytics. I see what you actually watch. I understand what he's doing. I understand that he's kind of saying that because part of it is just really being salty. And I understand how the YouTube system kind of can make you salty after a while. I was looking at that the other day. I upload a video of Mr. Clinton, 550,000 views. A board repair video, 15,000. I upload a video of me looking in a refrigerator, 50,000 views. Board repair, 9,000. He has the same issue that I do, where people always say, why don't you make more educational videos? But then when he actually makes them, nobody watches them. And it really does kind of simmer your, um, your enthusiasm, so to speak. And I don't know, what my own friends are telling me, oh, I didn't even know you made a video in the last two weeks. You didn't show up my notifications. Like, yeah, yeah, Thank, thanks, Susan. Thank you, Susan. But at, at the end of the day, that's my fault. Because if I made stuff that people actually found interesting, if they, they would say, huh, I haven't seen a video from him in a while. Let's, let, me, let me check on his page and see what he made. At the end of the day, the algorithm is really an excuse that a lot of people use for the fact that they don't make stuff that's interesting enough for people to actually want to seek out their page and their content. Because there are some pages that I, there are some people I watch or, you know, if there's no, nothing in my feed for a while, I'll actually go and check their page just because I'm kind of curious what they're up to. Okay, what do we have here? So I'm gonna place that capacitor. Although I could honestly do this without the capacitor. Put that capacitor in place and the inductor. And I think the enthusiasm thing is a big part of why our current education system sucks. Because, I mean, you have the power to have lessons via, you know, video. You've had that for a really long time. So what you do is you could have the lessons, be, have the best, and the best enthusiastic take where you've gone over everything perfectly, and then you give that to everybody. And then the, the showing up would be, you know, the tutoring. So you wouldn't spend 40 minutes you know, having someone repeat something to you that they've repeated millions of times before, you maybe you'd have someone show you how to do it in a really, really good video where you have the best teacher that ever did it, get some crazy sum of money to produce the video once, not over and over again. That gets shown everybody. Are sensors on a MacBook board difficult to repair? 
Um, that's kind of like asking how long is a piece of string. It's like any other logic border pair, but sometimes it's not a logic border pair. Sometimes it's a track pair. Yeah, but at the end of the day, your question, what you just asked me is how long is a piece of string? Or how many pounds does a thing weigh? I have a whole playlist on sensor issues. Some are really, really easy. Some are total nightmare train wrecks. Don't ask me how long a piece of string is. That's really hard to answer. But yeah, what I'm thinking is you could have a teacher that does their best, like you could find the best teacher in the world, have them do their best enthusiastic take where the highest number of students understand what's going on, even if they didn't understand this topic before, after they hear this particular lecture, save that. Then when it comes to, tut then you'd have like the six or eight hours a day be the tutoring or the few hours that you show up in person be the tutoring back and forth where you get to ask questions, interrupt, say where you're confused and all that shit. There's so many different ways to organize things. But yeah, I, just try, I think it's hysterical that a lecture is something you're not supposed to interrupt where you listen to someone speak. So you're not supposed to interrupt for 30 or 40 minutes. You just listen to them speak. But you have to show up in person for that. And that person has to repeatedly give the lecture over and over and over and over and over again when VHS tape has existed forever and the Internet's been around for... With, you know, the ability for you to watch video online even if you don't have the best ISP for at least, at least 10 years now. Even in 2006, you know, okay, fine. Some people had Fios in 2006, some people had shit. But nowadays, almost anywhere you are, you can watch video on the internet. I don't get it. Found your channel on AVE EV block. Glad I found it. Awesome. Okay, do we get smoke popping out of the screen? Please don't smoke, please don't smoke, please don't smoke. Ha ha! Screen and backlight. That's it for today, and as always, I hope that you learn something.